Good morning and welcome to another Scott Logic webinar, where today I'm joined by one of our senior test engineers, Callum Akehurst Ryan. Following on from last month's webinar on fostering a DevOps culture, Callum has very kindly agreed to do two webinars for us on testing in the DevOps world. Today's webinar will cover how you create continuous testing, and then you can join us on the 22nd of April for the second part, which will be on exploratory testing. So details of how to join will be at the end of the webinar. So for those of you who haven't joined us before, my name's Claire Cox and I work on the business development team here at Scott Logic. And if you aren't familiar with Scott Logic, we're a technology consultancy that specializes in delivering bespoke software solutions for our clients. If you want to catch up on any of the webinars that you've missed, you can find them all on the Scott Logic YouTube channel. If you'd like a copy of the slides from today's webinar, you can download these in the handout section. And if you have any questions, please pop them in the question box and we'll take as many as we can at the end. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to your presenter, Callum. Thanks, Claire. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. So, talk about testing in the DevOps world, just a bit of an introduction um, to myself. Um, as Claire said, I'm one of the senior test engineers here for Scott Logic, um, with 13 years of experience across um, different platforms like fintech, banking, e-commerce and public health and safety. Um, I've written a couple of articles, uh, one in Test Magazine, um, about why I'm talking to developers about exploratory testing and more recently on Scott Logic's own blog uh, about continuous testing. And that's what uh, this is gonna be framed around. So let's jump into it. Um, for our continuous integration and conti uh, continuous delivery pipelines, we need to ensure that we have continuous confidence. Now, last uh, webinar in fostering a DevOps culture with Bartosz, we learned that there are different ways that a DevOps mindset can create a lasting impact into your culture. So we talked about how things uh, need to be low risk, that committing smaller amounts of code is lower risk than big bang releases. So there's less that can go wrong and there's less integration to manage. That we have feedback from quick code changes and we have feedback from team collaboration uh, being faster. So that means we can respond to any issues or any changes that we need much more quickly. He talked about flow uh, and how having automated deployments, uh, automated testing and removing bureaucracy and unneeded manual steps from your uh, pipeline can free up the team to actually work on change and feature delivery. And finally, uh, talked about learning so that small changes, experimentation and good feedback means that we're constantly learning about our product and we can make changes to respond to this. And that's because our infrastructure means that we're not afraid of change. Obviously, we want to promote all of these features and properties and continuous testing is the best way to facilitate that. So simply put, continuous testing is the ability to gather feedback on how regular code changes behave and impact the system. So every change we make, uh, we need to be able to tell that it hasn't regressed any existing behavior and also identify any boundary, corner and edge cases that might cause failure. So as you can see in the diagram here, uh, we use um, exploration and automation at every stage of our pipeline. To check for existing behavior, we need a suite of tests that can be run reliably and consistently at speed. And preferably, as I said, this is an automated suite of tests to remove the bureaucracy of that manual regression pack. And for new behavior, we need strong point of time exploratory testing to yield information related to new features or code. That's going to give us useful information that can influence the design and the build of our product. Um, so that means that the information needs, that we get from exploratory testing needs to be really useful to our team. It needs to be focused and influence design. And we need to have tests at every stage of our pipeline. So they need to be the right tests. They need to be meaningful in the context, uh, context of what's being run. So the ways that this will support the CICD pipeline is, well, low risk. Having fast and automated tests means that we're happier to make more changes rather than trying to batch them up. And those small changes are less risky to implement. 
having continuous testing provides faster feedback and that gives meaningful point in time information about our build and means we know when to act that's the feedback and continuous testing means that we can keep up our development flow there's not any extra steps uh, to check for regression and those fast feedback loops means that information is timely and relevant freeing us up to work on other things and finally uh, having strong tests in place give us that safe low risk environment in which to try out ideas and experiment we can do a to b testing so and we know that our tests will catch failure as a result of any changes made and that all sounds awesome but you know we're not doing that at the moment and there's a number of reasons why we're not one of the key reasons uh, for our automated testing uh, frameworks failing to provide what we need for continuous testing is that we're not writing tests or at the very least we're not writing the right kind of tests we're not writing comprehensive units and integration tests because we think they take too long we don't see the value in writing them or maybe we just include a bit of linting and the minimum number of unit tests to check the happy path and we think that's enough sometimes we see that there's a focus on manual testing so we don't include good automation and that's not going to um, support the CI/CD pipeline because we have a manual acceptance step or even worse we think testing is someone else's problem there's a test versus dev divide uh, we throw testing over the line and that means we end up with a lot of end-to-end -end automation rather than that point in time code-based uh, integration and service level testing that we need another issue that we see is that we write the wrong tests we focus on code coverage over functionality coverage or our automation as i've said is end-to-end -end based uh, rather than being service or integration level tests and frequently we neglect boundary cases and data variations or even integration tests because we think they take too long to write and we don't focus on them when we do write tests sometimes we don't trust them they don't inspire confidence in our system regressions are frequently missed because we're not testing those areas of the code or those areas of behavior or we find that tests are really flaky and they keep breaking so we end up just ignoring them and not running them and that's because test data frequently is bad so the tests just fall over or the environments are out and that leads to us just being used to test failing we're awash in a sea of red tests we get snow blind and just start ignoring them completely they're not trusted and they're not inspiring confidence and that all comes basically because we don't have time for testing they take too long to write uh, we don't have the time to refactor our code and add tests uh, because our team or our stakeholders aren't prioritizing the writing of tests and where we have the wrong tests where we have these large end-to-end -end suites we find that they take too long to run so we ignore them or we batch commit our code to minimize the amount of times that we have to run the tests which is basically big bang we see uh, frequently tests take a full day to run at the end of the sprint so we batch all our code together we cross our fingers and hope that nothing bad is going to come out of the test suite that's being run so I'm going to hand over to Claire now uh, for a poll yeah let me just launch this poll here so you should see this on your screens now so the question that we're asking you all is what's stopping your continuous testing so the options that you've got to choose from and you can only select one is not knowing what to test seeing no value in adding tests uh, long running tests skills uh, slash tooling or buy-in from team and stakeholders so i'm not going to give you that long to place your votes i can see that a few of you are voting already so i'll just give you a few more uh, seconds to get those votes in and then I'm going to close this poll and share the results with you all gosh this is changing by the second <laughs> <laughs> this really is your last chance to uh, get your vote in and then I'm going to share these results right let's close this and share the results so you should see the results on your screen now um and uh the most it, it was fluctuating wildly but for a while there the majority of people were saying it was buy-in from team and sk stakeholders let me pass you back to callum 
Yeah, that's those are really interesting answers and something that I, I would expect really. Um, hopefully in the in the next couple of slides, um, as I go through the properties of continuous testing, I'll be able to um, focus on some of those things and at least give us a direction on um, being able to talk about the buy-in um, that we need and um, what to start looking at um, upskilling ourselves to help with this. So we want to do continuous testing. Let's look at the properties of what that means for us. So our continuous tests have to provide confidence in the right thing. And that means knowing that the product will behave correctly for all of our business logic, happy paths and error cases, the boundary cases, corner cases and edge cases. Frequently, uh, when our um, teams write unit tests, they're frequently just writing red, green, deploy, happy tests and leaving it that. So we're missing out large areas of functionality uh, in those negative cases. And to reduce feedback loops and improve the speed of our automated test running, we should be aiming to cover that business logic off at the lowest level possible. So that means at a unit or service level, because these are the cheapest and fastest types of tests to run. This means breaking down business flows away from end-to-end -end tests and knowing what to test at the service and integration level. So as such, I've suggested adding uh, an additional layer to the testing triangle that you can see here uh, of service level tests. And these are code driven tests to check the confidence of a service uh, and our business logic. And we implement them in the same way that we would TDD style testing. So that would mean uh, testers coming, working with your developers to show that we can shift business logic testing away from end to end tests and to smaller, level, uh, smaller levels of testing. And one of the skills that we need there is the ability to feed into um, that, those code level tests as they're being written. And team, testers can bring testing knowledge heuristics and critical thinking to identify what should be tested whilst we're writing code. So I've said use TDD to add further tests during refactoring following that red green deploy. And frequently try and use dev and test pairing both ways. So at the coding, so that testers can develop the skills in knowing how to write these unit service and integration tests, but also developers get involved with pairing during exploratory testing to help identify where risks sit within your code. And thinking of risks, we can use risk mapping to identify scenarios and add them to JIRA tickets to aid with development. If you don't have the time for pairing, being able to have a risk map of all the different areas to cover off those negative edge boundary cases is really going to help you. And generally testers, you need to follow uh, foster a quality culture and coach people with thinking and quality in mind to move away from a happy path so that we're not just uh, providing confidence in you know, how things should work, but also how they work in a, in a situation where there's errors taking place. And that's going to help with buy-in. We need to really be uh, championing that quality culture to help with buy-in, uh, not just of our team, but of our stakeholders as well. Next property is that our test environments need to be lightweight. So monolithic environments are hard to maintain and they take a really long time to build. And that prevents us from making and deploying small changes rapidly to promote the multiple builds we need uh, for continuous integration and deployment. What we need is lightweight environments that we can spin up quickly for testing. So invest in virtualized containers to run components and integrations over. So I suggest uh, looking into Docker so that we can deploy and test our architecture or parts of our architecture much more quickly. As you can see from the top diagram there, we can create small lightweight environments using single containers. They just run one service uh, under test to improve the speed of the build. And when we're doing this, it's really useful to stub and inject in test data up and downstream processes need to be catered for. And we can do that directly via test code. When we're writing service and integration code level tests, we can just inject up and downstream dependencies there um, so that they'll be more controlled and we don't have to spin up multiple services. And where we do want that integration testing, as you can see in the second diagram, we can build pairs of services connected by a bridge networks rather than build everything. And again, we can use stubs or inject data to pass in any up or downstream dependencies, knowing full well that they're going to be tested in their own small environments. So looking into uh, networking uh, from Docker 
is again a really important skill to have and it's going to increase buy-in to your team to use these quick environments because they're going to be more robust and faster to use and use images to make things more robust because we can spin up data in a known state using a snapshot image of our data this is going to make your test more reliable knowing that the starting position of the data uh, is where that sits and it's going to prevent failing through data not being cleared down or reverted after a test run setting certain states within uh, an image can allow for the bypass of a lot of processes and it's going to increase the speed and the flow of your testing and a lot of this is going to be really complex because you're setting up a lot of environments and bridge networks and potentially a lot of stubs so rather than manually configure this each time we need to invest in an orchestration system something like Docker Compose or Kubernetes to manage our environments to make sure that they're spun up in a known state. So one of the skills that we need to again look into is around uh, Docker Compose, Kubernetes, different orchestration systems. And testers, again, you can support your teams by investigating flows to see where we can move tests to those integration points so that we know how to break down our systems into these pair networks. We can look at what data needs to be fed into service tests via our stubbing or injection of data into the code. So look at the boundary, border, edge and negative cases that we want to cover off. And support the addition of tests at the units and service level to just to increase coverage during refactoring in, in TDD. So once we have tests, uh, we need to be able to trust them to provide the confidence that any changes that we're making to our system are safe for deployment. As soon as our tests become distrusted, they're going to start to get ignored or silently left to fail. And that's not going to provide confidence in or any feedback about the quality of our builds. So there's a couple of reasons why uh, we might lose confidence in our automation suite. If tests fail unnecessarily or need debugging, now, flakily written tests rely on system data being in a certain position, and they can easily become out of step if tests fail or just after running generally. So running our tests on known state images by using those um, snapshotted images or injected data of our tests is gonna resolve those issues. So because each time we spin up the environment, we're gonna have the data in that initial spun up known state. Sometimes environment outages caused by dependent systems failing or the network being down, or even hardware issues uh, cause our tests to fail unnecessarily. So we need to keep our environment simple through those small containerized environments running one service or just pairs of services and having them isolated from each other is gonna stop those dependencies from causing our whole test suite to flakily fall down. And finally, tests fail unnecessarily because they're just not written in a robust way. They try to do too much. They try to be like those end-to-end -end tests, or they rely on other tests to set up data. We chain our tests. So we need to make sure that we're simplifying tests to make them easier to run and debug. So each test should ideally be testing one thing, not many things. We sometimes lose confidence in our tests because they're not checking what we want them to. They're not updated in line with changes being made to the code base. They're not actually checking for current or new behavior. Things are missed, and that means that bugs crop up in production, so people start to think tests aren't worth it, which reduces that buy-in to having them. So tests need to be reviewed for coverage and updated regularly. Whenever we make code changes to an area or whenever we refactor an area, we should take that time to have a look at the positive, negative, and edge and boundary cases that we have to make sure that they're relevant. And sometimes there's still an automate everything approach to testing. We, we lose buy-in and we lose confidence because we think that automation is gonna solve all of our quality needs. When instead we should be looking to cover some of the gaps or some of the cases with point of time exploratory testing to find that information rather than investing in a lot of automation around that. So to keep confidence in our automation tests, as we've talked about, we need to ensure that they are maintained, that they're fixed, and kept up to date. To aid with this, uh, some little tricks that we can do to make things more maintainable are to add our tests to the same repo as the services they cover, because then it's easy to see what our coverage is and where our tests are. We can ensure that tests are named to give meaning so that, that we know what does that test actually cover. 
we need to write them in the same language as the code. So one of the skills that we need to be looking at testers is what languages are our developers writing tests in, and we need to upskill ourselves to be able to write those same languages. And also we need to be able to keep our tests small and simple so that they're really easy to debug. If I know that a test has failed, I know what service or what behavior is failing. And it's not just enough to make sure that our tests are maintainable, we also have to make sure that they are maintained. So in stand-ups testers, ensure that someone's looking at any failing test and debugging them. We're not just ignoring them as a team. We need to be able to review and refactor any existing test to make sure that they're still useful and providing relevant information. And sometimes that's gonna result in removing unnecessary tests. Be like Mary Kondo. If a test is not sparking joy or providing useful information, get rid of it, maintain it. And as well as tests, we need to make sure we're maintaining data, either in our images of snapshotted data or injected via the code up to date with any changes that are being made to make sure that tests are not being flaky. We talked about um, having tests when they're failing or seeing when they're failing being maintained. To help with that, we need to make sure that our test monitoring is obvious and clear. The results of testing need to be seen during our build acceptance or deployment uh, stages in our pipeline. Tools like Jenkins here provide multiple dashboard displays to show the results of testing, while some other tools can send emails or be integrated into Slack to provide that feedback. When we do create dashboards, we need to make sure that they're displayed to the team via a monitor or a TV to show the current health of the system. So that if something is failing or if emails are being sent, these are being quickly identified and fixed. And to assist with monitoring, we need to make sure that our tests are clearly labeled and traceable, like I said. So we need to provide meaningful names to our tests where tests are showing exactly what has failed by not testing too much. And we need to make sure that when we are looking at things to debug them, that logging is meaningful and makes it easy for us to find out what the problem is. And thinking of logging, production monitoring is also really important. We need metrics that's gonna allow us to be able to predict problems that might arise. We need to be able to check for things like user concurrency, CPU and memory usage, uh, system component failures or failovers. And all of those need to be backed up with meaningful logs that have relevant labeling in them to show uh, the workflow that a user's undertaken. And working in your team with embedded testers can help with identifying trends and logging to make things more meanable, uh, meaningful and traceable. And it's also gonna allow you to, as testers, uh, keep the team to task when builds are failing. So get in there and help your team with debugging. And finally, uh, tests have to be able to go fast. Longer run times for testing and deploying means that we, will, we are more likely to go back to big bang and commit lots of changes rather than little and often. And that's risky because it prevents flow. So we want short and quick test cycles that provide quick feedback, ideally no more than 20 minutes, although that's gonna change based on the size of your system under test. To help with that, don't fall afoul of automate everything approaches because large number of tests are gonna bloat the time taken to run your test suite. So do that managing um, maintenance and refactoring of tests, remove them if you can to keep uh, your test suite fast. Use modern CICD pipeline tools to run tests in parallel because that's gonna allow for faster feedback. So split your unit test by runtime in the config of the runners or um, have multiple instances of service and integration tests run by parallelizing different instances of browsers or environments through those different containers. You can add tests to the same area of codes that they test, or as your code base increases in complexity, hide areas uh, behind flags, because that gives you the options of running and building only the specific tests that you need to allow your test suite to go fast. But if you do that, make sure that at least once in your pipeline, you're building your whole architecture to get that confidence in everything being deployed uh, and built and run. And just as a trick, you can schedule your integration tests before any service level tests, because that's gonna check that the environment has been built properly and fast fail on build issues rather than functional or behavior issues. And testers in your team can help to review these things um, 
review the tests to make sure they're providing adequate coverage or can be refactored down to increase speed. And I've talked a lot about testers in your team. Now, one of the big things that testers are going to bring into a CICD pipeline, as well as all that maintenance, is exploratory testing. It's really important to know that an automated pipeline is not a magic bullet that's going to solve all of your quality issues. And I'm going to talk about exploratory testing in the next webinar and how that can support your CICD pipeline. To build your skills and to also help with buy-in, you need to pair to design tests. Show the value, testers, of what you're bringing to the table. Show the value of TDD or pairing to increase the coverage of service and integration level tests. And increase your own skills. Use pairing to help with static analysis of code. Get developers to run through with you to identify um, where any gaps in negative edge corner or boundary cases are run. Get them to go through the logic of their code to help you with that. Have a look at test review. Once you've got some of those skills, once you can start reading code, have a look at the tests that exist. Do that maintenance. Review tests to see what can be refactored, removed, or merged together. Check that coverage provides confidence. And from all of your monitoring, use observations to see where failure points are, where things are being missed, so that we can add more tests. And finally, Champion that quality culture to really increase buy-in. You can really help your whole team to help with all of this quality activity. You can aid developers to become more T-shaped by helping them to have a testing mindset. And they can help you to have that development mindset and to look at the skills and tooling required uh, for lower level codes. So that's everything I was going to talk about today. It looks like I've, I've run quite long. Sorry about that. But for our next steps, uh, please join us for our next webinar, which is going to be testing in the DevOps world, exploratory testing. Like I mentioned, there's going to be a link down there. Um, and I'm sure it's going to be shared on social media so you can uh, find it quite easily. And also read our blog post about continuous testing. It goes into um, a lot of the things that we talked about here. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Claire for a wrap up and for any questions. Yeah, we've got a few in here. So um, one of them says, hi, Callum, the Jenkins test dashboard in the picture. Would it be possible if you could share that plugin? What's the name of it? Um, yes, I will go find that out and I will get Claire to send out um, details of the plugin. Uh, and specifics around Jenkins afterwards. I don't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> it was uh, mostly just an image that I had for the slides. No problem. I'd be happy to share that after the webinar. Um, another one here, you talk about adding more tests for coverage, but also removing tests to keep the suite fast. Which one should we do? Yeah, that's really important. So we need to make sure that our tests are covering the right thing and at the lowest level possible. What we see is sometimes uh, we find somebody's got a framework for tests uh, and they know how to write one test and then they build it up with loads and loads and loads of different test variables. They say, oh, special characters, I'll put an exclamation mark in, now a new test with an at symbol, now a new test with um, these different naughty strings. We need to crush those together and reduce down tests that are basically covering the same things. Uh, so we have logic. Uh, being covered off, but maybe not every data variable, because that's something that we can do much more elegantly with exploratory testing. As long as the logic is covered, then we're good. So we need to make sure that's where our coverage sits. So it's about having the right tests rather than um, huge bulky amounts of tests. Uh, great. We've got all sorts coming through here. So I'm trying to read it all very quickly. Um, somebody said, not a question, but anyway, help spread the word about mutation testing, smiley face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, different things like mutation tests and the different tools that are available for that are really powerful. Um, I talked about data coverage. Mutation testing is a way that we can actually do that. Uh, and there are lots of tools out there that can help to get those codes um, inputs just slightly tweaked time by time uh, to get out there. So yeah, definitely something to talk about. Um, whether or not we integrate them into our CICD pipeline or whether or not we run them as part of exploratory testing um, is, is 
sort of a discussion that we could have, uh, but probably don't have the time for right now. <laughs> Yeah, I think we've just about used our time up. That's bang on half past 10. So there, there are some more questions there. Um, I'm sure, Callum, if I send these to you after the webinar, that you'd be happy to um, to respond to these by email, if that's the case. Yes, of course. Just volunteering you there. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. So if anybody's got any other questions, you can send them to me. My email address is ccox, that's C-C-O-C-K-S, at scottlogic.com. Feel free to drop me an email after the webinar and I'll be happy to, uh, to get those answered for you. Um, we've already shared the link for the next one. You'll also get an email, the, the sort of standard thank you for joining us, one which will be sent out tomorrow. That's as well gonna have the link for you to register for the next one, which is on the 22nd of April. Um, and like I say, if you've missed any of our webinars, you can find them all in the Scott Logic YouTube channel. So that's all from us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Callum for today's webinar. And we hope that we see you all next time.